we believe that all black children should go to HBCUs, but we also believe that these environments should be places that teach them a deeper level of pride. <laughs> It's dark as obsidian, and it's light and beautiful and bright as the sun, the salt of the earth, fire burning and water dripping. How could they be using goddess of magic? She is timeless. The blood that doesn't need a blood. She is the wildest woman. And let me say it again for those who need to hear it. The black woman is God. Let me say it again. The black woman is God. Listen up. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. I am your girl, Debbie and McKee, the original wireless woman, and welcome back to my spot, room 303. If you are new, welcome to the crew. But my returnees, you know what we do. If you like this video, well, then like this video video let the comments reveal how you really feel and if you're feeling a vibe well go ahead on and subscribe but before you blink share this link so welcome welcome back wi-fi i said hey welcome back wi-fi uh -oh. so as corny as that was this is my jiggle what jiggle boo episode of the wireless woman where i will be talking all about my experiences as an hbcu cheerleader so you already know what time it is it is time to call the row i need all of my cheer five ladies to the front of the class it is time to read aloud Have a plethora of female bodies to represent this culture but no female voices and welcome back to another episode of the wireless woman go ahead and do me a favor on the way in and like this video why because if you like it well then i love it also make sure you subscribe to my channel and share this link yes share this link Today, I do want to highlight a few new subscribers that I have gotten on my channel. I have gotten really backed up with new subscribers. And I will also say that if you have a private YouTube account, which by all means do, you do not show up in my notifications. So I want to give a very special special shout out to all of my new subscribers who do have private or hidden accounts. I see you and I appreciate you. But for those of you who are public and who I am able to shout out, here we go. Welcome to the channel. Much appreciated. You know what to do. Much appreciated. Welcome to the crew. Thank you. It's not going to, okay. Much 
Much appreciated. Oh, before we get into today's episode, I do want to start with a disclaimer that my commentary, and it is a commentary on HBCU chair culture. This is an open discussion and not intended to be an indictment on any particular individuals. I truly enjoy my cheering days at my alma mater and have a deep respect and camaraderie for the ladies with whom I cheered and for the leadership as well. However, I do want to begin to open up discussions that center around the experience because when you are a commentator versus when you are a member of a population, you can tend to look at the representation in two completely different ways. So when I came to Fayetteville State in the fall of 1999, shout out to Prince, I was an optimistic freshman. I didn't really think that I would make the varsity cheerleading team like first go round because I came from what they call a classic cheer background. So, you know, I was one of three black girls on the cheerleading squad and much of the same criticism that I have about cheering in my majority white squad I also likewise have about cheering for an HBCU and that should kind of tell you something when I came to the campus it became apparent to me right away that I was way out of my depth with the HBCU cheer style. If you have not grown up in that stylized cheering, I was a fish out of water. I had to practice night and day, day and night, working, 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 day and night. Like I literally had to work and work and work and day and night to get just the smallest nuances of the movement, the quality of movement, right? You know, I was very stiff. I was very up high with my cheering and, you know, HBCU cheering is down here. It's down and it's low and it's, uh, mm. you're not like, hey let's go team like everything was up and high from my high school days so when i got the hbcu cheering it was like and you know what hey 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 like i wasn't ready for any of that like it was very aggressive but um be aggressive be e aggressive okay i'm chasing squirrels and rabbits but anyway I was one of the first girls to go and sign up. The team that I was joining was already going through a transition because of a lot of upheaval that would end up actually affecting the group of cheerleaders that I started with as well. Our team was almost majority freshmen because there had already been cheer insurrection, if you will, when we got there. So it left a lot of room for freshmen to be able to make the varsity squad. So like I said, I'm not going to act like I was the most talented cheerleader because that wouldn't necessarily be a correct depiction of what was going on. But I was definitely one of the stronger technical cheerleaders on my squad. So when we tried out our score, was like 25% something that they called image. And I would come to find out over my years of HBCU cheering that image had a lot to do basically with just your appeal and desirability. And for a girl who looked like me, it was going to be difficult to have a very high image score. As a matter of fact, the weighted percentage of that score went up over the time that I was on the cheerleading squad in an attempt to flush out girls that look like me. Um, so while I had very high technical scores and I was able to score a lot of what they called special skill points that came from being able to do splits and tumbling and stunting the technical elements of cheer, 
I literally made the 15th, the last slot on the varsity team, despite the fact that I was technically stronger than all the other girls on the team, simply because my image score was so low. <laughs> and I would subsequently go through several attempts throughout the three years that I cheered in college to get me off the squad in different ways. Um, systems of demerits that had to do with what color shorts I wore to practice and just really, really elaborate plots to alienate and humiliate certain girls on the squad. So when I say girls who look like me, I mean dark skinned girls. So despite being one of the stronger technical cheerleaders and working very, very, very hard throughout the years to really master the style, I would often be put on the third row in the back row of cheer formations. Um, and that was tough, you know, and this is kind of a side note, but I see that in America when it comes to how black people are kind of portrayed because when you put the more desirable people in front of the harder working, more skilled people, it causes a system of mediocrity because even those people who can do much, 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 much better than the people that are being put forward and promoted, why would you do that? If you're going to be put on the back of the bus, no matter how hard you work, you know, that's why we have to be careful in the black culture of creating these unfair competitions because it just brings down the whole quality of how we treat each other when the evaluation system is based on things that people can't control genetics you're not going to get your best product out of that type of selection process and we kept seeing that you know the other dark skin very skilled cheerleaders had to constantly be in this die hard competition against people that were just considered traditionally more desirable than us, whether their skill level was at our level or not. And that's a real tough situation to be in. You have to really have a natural desire within yourself to compete against yourself at the highest level because you know your efforts are not going to be rewarded because of how you physically look. You know, and like I said, we have to guard against this in the black race and the black culture all the way across the board because we want our most excellent product to go forward. You know, we cannot be like racial supremacists separating ourselves out into desirability categories. And like I said, the cheer culture, even coming from high school into college, was that. We're going to put our most attractive girls on the front, whether they work hard or are good at what they do or not. These are going to be the ones that we put out front. So another aspect of something that I had a really, really difficult issue with was texturism. We had to deal with colorism, texturism, and featureism very heavily in this environment. It's already a tough situation to be in when you're at a black college being disparaged for being black. I kind of, it was commonplace on a white squad, but I had not expected that when I came to a predominantly black college. And it wasn't just a matter of it being this unspoken desirability. This was built into the metric you know, I consistently made it onto the squad by the skin of my teeth year after year after year because of how low my image score would inevitably be. You know, I had to stay under 125 pounds or else I was off the squad. <laughs> we had to keep our hair done in a certain way. Um, that was what they considered all American standards, which was European standards of beauty. We had to wear curls ponytails, ribbons, and bows. And I also take 
criticism with that because you're dressing up grown women to look like young dolls in this hyper sexualized way because we're wearing these short revealing clothes but we're wearing makeup with super rosy cheeks and ribbons and bows and curls it it was a whole lot of stuff that just don't go together let's just be honest and, you know, we dealt a lot with that grown men. I was at one game where this one grown man <laughs> was hanging over the rafters yelling, I want to see some ass. <laughs> there were squads that were much more progressive than the one that I was on. The Winston-Salem State cheerleading team. <laughs> They were a really diverse squad that was skills driven. Like you saw the best, brightest, sharpest cheerleaders be put to the front, regardless of how they looked or the hairstyles that they had within our conference. Anyway, Johnson C. Smith was a very strong team that really led with skills based. They had a more classic traditional style of cheer. So their cheerleaders were assessed on their skill as opposed to just their desirability. And because they were a strong stunt squad. You had larger, more shapely, muscular girls. You had smaller girls. That's the way you put together a stunt team. You know, if everybody is 125 pounds, who's gonna do the lifting? But, I say that to say that this was not necessarily the experience of every black HBCU cheerleader, but I do want to call us as a people and a culture into account to say that, you know, when I look at these majorettes and everyone's in a line with baby hair and silky tresses and revealing clothing, like, are we continuing to push forward European standards of beauty on young, impressionable black women? What does this really say of HBCU culture when your cheerleaders and your majorettes perpetuate European standards of beauty? When they have to have European as opposed to West African body types? you know, when they are heavily encouraged, like you could be benched and set out of a game if your hair was not done to the specifications and standards of the squad. It wasn't that you had to have your hair done nice and presentable. It was that you had to have your hair done just like the person next to you. If it was a curl day, we wore curls. If it was a wave day, we wore waves, but we never had like an Afro day. We never had like a faux lock day. You know, we didn't even wear ethnic styles. We had ponytails, we had half up, half down. We had some girls on the squad that had short hair, but they were still heavily encouraged to weave their hair. You could be given demerits if you chose not to. And those demerits would lead to you being put off the squad. So, you know, this is intended to be something that makes us begin to look at that because even in the 20 years since I've left school, when I'm watching it, and I mean, y'all, I love black band, black cheer. It's the culture of it. It's nothing else like it. You know, this is who we are as people. And at our best, it celebrates the spirit and athleticism of Black women. Cheering is a sport. It is not just auxiliary. You know, our dance, our body, this is meant to be a celebration of Black culture. So I just want to put it forward to say are we exhibiting the best, the diversity of who we are, or are we pigeonholing young, impressionable black women that will one day be mothers and 
doctors and lawyers into a certain facet of desirability. Like, I think some of the programming was so toxic. It just wasn't something that made me proud to be black, dark. You know, these are literally tales from the dark side. It didn't make me feel pride in being a dark natural woman you know it made me feel like a carbon copy caricature of the girl next to me and 20 years later we're still seeing that same pattern our cheer motto was image is everything but the image of what exactly you know i saw girls be objectified around an image of something that they really couldn't live up to. And I'm not going to go into it in this video, but it had ramifications on their personal life, on the types of relationships that they chose. You know, a lot of these women would end up in relationships with football players and basketball players, you know, really playing out a certain dynamic that didn't necessarily encourage them to be the best that they could be. It encouraged them to be better than her or to compete for the same standard of beauty. You know, and I just think that HBCU culture on every facet should be about our diversity in unity. That's what university is. It is the unity of diversity. And at that level, you know, at that level of education, our minds should be open enough. We should be exploring a consciousness that doesn't look at black women as a monolith. Unfortunately, we live in a world where black women are made to compete against each other and not given the opportunity to be just unique, to explore what femininity is in a multilateral way. I really feel like being an HBCU cheerleader clipped my wings in certain ways. And even if that seems like some sort of bitter, salty pill, because clearly <laughs> if you've been following my videos, I had some very <laughs> negative experiences with other black women in school. And I think it is because we're put into this impossible race, this great race against each other. And I think that institutions like this create that type of dynamic. But by the third year that I was there, by my junior year, every dark skinned cheerleader that had been on that squad with me left. It was basically a repeat of what had happened the three years before we got there because that inability and unwillingness to change, you know, that winning at all costs, that false self image is everything mentality eroded our fellowship with each other, our fellowship with our leadership. You know, there was a certain expectation of how we would show up and how we would look that didn't allow us to express or explore our womanhood. It was stifling. It was trifling. And, you know, even just within that microchasm of us being on that squad together, we had to, at a certain point, have enough respect for ourselves and for our image to disconnect from being told that image is everything, but not your image, not you, though. This is something that I'm hoping that by hearing it from the horse's mouth will help young women who are currently in that situation and coming through this system to be able to have a better experience than the ones that me and my colleagues had. So, as I've always said, this is an open discussion. By all means, leave me a comment. If you yourself have been a cheerleader or know someone who has, if you've seen these beautiful, gorgeous, amazingly talented women, you know, on TV or on social media, just doing the dang thing and thought to yourself, like, they all kind of look just like each other. 
by all means, leave me a comment. Tell me what you think and what your opinion is on it, because we are here for a meeting of the minds. This is something that, you know, over 20 years now of being out of that system, you know, I've, I've had time to think about it and mull it over and look back on it with a mature and fresh perspective and say, there were things that was glorious about what we represented and there's also an ugly side to it you know and hopefully by bringing some exposure some awareness to what my experiences were like we can open that discussion up and try to project a more inclusive image of what hbcu life and culture is especially now that it's becoming so much more center stage you know as we're seeing so much more emphasis and attention be brought to this hbcu system i want to see us be everything that we can be if you follow me on social media you've heard myself and my sister tan say we believe that all black children should go to hbcus but we also believe that these environments should be places that teach them a deeper level of pride in themselves in the way that they look, the way that they're made, and pushes them to develop their God-given talents in a way that only they can manifest it. So, as always, I am your girl, yeah. Debbie and Nikki, your neighborhood wireless you woman. Go ahead and drop that fire headphones me. emoji in my comments for me, so and I will see Even you in the comments. Until the next time, class is now dismissed.